Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Ani Gellis and I am the Community Programs Manager at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And I am delighted to see all of you this evening for our archival film screening of some Bethlehem Steel films. And uh, tonight we're going to be joined by two panelists who are sharing some of their insights and information. Um, so Siobhan, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here tonight to uh, watch these movies with you and talk a little bit about them. Um, so my name is Siobhan Hagen. I am the CEO of uh, MARMIA, is what we call it, but that stands for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Moving Image Archive. And we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's based in Baltimore City. And our mission is to preserve and provide access to the movies and sound recordings that document our region's history. So you're going to see um, one clip from our WJZ TV collection, which I think if you're local to Baltimore, you'll probably know that WJZ is a local TV station. And it's been around since the late 1940s, was, uh, the third TV station, I believe, that got set up in Baltimore. Um, and we have their archive and we are digitizing it and putting it upload, uh, we're uploading it online for everyone to view and see and have access to these amazing records of our history and our region. And, um, you know, just wanted to talk a little bit about how to, uh, you know, obviously you can watch and enjoy these films just in and of themselves, but I find that kind of having a little bit of a, uh, you know, a critical thinking cap on while you're, while you're watching them kind of helps uh, enjoy them even more, especially if you aren't really, like myself, don't really know that much about maybe the topic uh, and the technical topic that they're, they might be talking about, like some of the things that we're going to screen tonight. So some of the things I just want to kind of put out there for archival films whenever you watch them tonight and in the future uh, is kind of, and also this could be actually media that you watch now um, as well, is asking questions, uh, even if you don't know the answer, just thinking about who, who made the movie, like who, who was the creator, um, what was their intended audience, so who did they make it for, right? Um, what was the purpose of this movie? So yeah, sure, they had an audience, and then what did they want to, what was the message that they were trying to um, convey to that audience? And then, uh, you know, there's so many other questions you could ask, but another thing to regularly ask is who is in the frame? Like, who are you seeing? Uh, and then who aren't you seeing? So who's not included? Uh, and then maybe also just kind of evaluating, like, why? Why would someone be in this? and be in, in something that they would want to send out to an audience, and why would they maybe not want to include something in an audience? Uh, and then with the passing of time, uh, I feel like there's even more information that we can uh, take from these films uh, that, you know, by comparing the past with, with the present and things that we know in the present that happened in between that time. So. Um, even if, even if that's just like, uh, you know, feelings, even if it's like, wow, I'm, I'm really sad after watching that, uh, you know, feelings are information that we can learn from as well. So, yeah, so that's, those are like my, my tips for viewing archival films, uh, especially ones that you might not know too much about what the technical issues that they're going to be getting into like tonight. So yeah, so the first film, uh, well actually it's video that we're going to be watching, uh, it was recorded onto video, is from our, the collection that I discussed, WJZ TV, and that's part of Marmia's collections. And this clip is from the late 1970s from a show called Evening Magazine, which some folks might remember, that was shown every evening night. And it was about a half hour, I believe, and it, it just showed a mix of mostly local, like, entertainment stories, just stories about people and places and events that were happening in, the, in Baltimore City, in Maryland, sometimes in D.C., sometimes they even went up to New York City as well. 
And um, yeah, and it's just like, it's mostly, it's more about, um, more about like a lifestyle, like it's, it's more about our lives and um, jobs and people. And so that, that is why they did this story visiting the, uh, the shipyard or the steel yard and like basically just going through and giving everyone an overview of what happens there. Um, so I think it's, and it's like a lower, you know, it's really, it's a lower budget kind of uh, look and thinking about, you know, the audience that, w that they were intending was, you know, you and I through our TV sets at home who might not, you know, who know about Bethlehem Steel but don't necessarily know what goes on in there and um and then just kind of taking it for for what it is which is glorious and has some wonderful music going on in there and you know it's a it's a really cool time capsule i think excellent well thank you so much we really appreciate you sharing your insights with us this evening yes and enjoy These things here are slag bowls. They are full of slag, which is taken off the top of the molten steel. It's the first part of the process of taking the impurities out of the steel. Bethlehem Steel is also a very noisy place. The steel that comes out of here will go on to be used in steel siding, steel wires, nails, tin plates, steel plates, and many, many other products. It takes a lot of iron ore to make steel. And iron ore for this plant comes from many parts of the world. It comes from Canada, from South America, from Africa. Now this huge ship, the Mineral Belgium, has just arrived here from Norway with 60,000 tons of iron ore. The iron ore is offloaded by these gigantic cranes. The iron ore can be conveyed directly into the blast furnace, or it can be transferred by conveyor to nearby stacker reclaimers. From these stacker reclaimers, it can then be put directly into the blast furnace when necessary. There are many different types of iron ore. This particular type is called Goa. It is from India. And on top of this is, is a substance called fine. It's a very fine material. And this substance has to be knocked off before it goes into the blast furnace because it interferes with the smelting process. But this is a nut. It's the proper size of ore to go into the blast furnace. This is Blast Furnace J on Blast Furnace Row. This is one of the most spectacular steps in making steel. Actually, what happens here is a making of iron that will later be turned into steel. This is the principle of a blast furnace. The iron ore, limestone, and coke are layered in the furnace. Superheated air at 1800 degrees is blasted through from the bottom. The result is molten iron that flows like lava. Insulated railroad cars called submarines wait below the furnace to carry the iron to where it will be made into steel. This is the basic oxygen furnace. This is where iron is made into steel. Steel is a resulting product when carbon and other impurities are removed from the iron. Still hot from the blast furnace, iron is poured into large vessels. Pure oxygen is fed into the vessels. The oxygen supports the rapid burning of the carbon and other impurities. The temperature rises to 2,900 degrees. Equipment in a control room allows the refining to be carefully monitored. TV screens and dials display the conditions of the violent process. Okay, all you have to do is uh, hold it up and tell them where you want it. The refined steel is poured from the larger vessels into smaller ladles. These ladles will fill even smaller cast iron molds that form ingots. 
Right now, I'm walking through rows of cast iron molds, and inside these molds is steel. They're making steel ingots. The steel is cooling now. You may remember that when it was poured into these molds, it went in at 2,900 degrees, and that it is extremely hot here right now. Now, depending on the size of the mold, they can make steel ingots here from 6 to 40 tons. From here, the steel is taken and rolled into sheets of steel. At the slab mill, the ingots are reheated. Here, intense heat serves a different purpose than in the earlier steps. Before, heat was used to smelt and refine the metals. Now, heat is needed to keep the steel pliable. These ingots can now be rolled and lengthened. Two operators work as a team to move the ingots through rolls that make the ingots longer and flatter. These are called slabs. This is the first step in rolling it into thinner sheets. And here's what they look like when they come out of the uh, slabbing mill. These slabs are beginning to cool now, although they're still quite hot, and they take on this natural blue-gray color. These look to be about uh, 6 or 8 inches thick and maybe 12 feet long, although they do come in uh, varying thicknesses and sizes. They're on the way now to the hot strip mill, where they will be milled down to much thinner thicknesses, so thin that they will become sheet metal and can even eventually be rolled up into rolls. Once again, the slabs are reheated for the hot strip mill. This mill has a long series of roll stands that squeeze the hot steel into a long, flat sheet. It becomes longer and longer and thinner and thinner as it moves through the roll. by Bethlehem Steel. So steel making is quite a process here at Baltimore's Bethlehem Steel. They start with something that looks like no more than sandy rocks, and they refine that and turn it into steel products that we use every day. Behind me is Furnace L. When it is completed later this year, it will be the largest in the Western Hemisphere and able to produce 8,000 tons of iron a day. Furnace L is just the latest improvement in a steel mill that's been making steel in Baltimore for almost 100 years. We'll be back in just a minute. Hello everyone, my name is Don Williams. I'm a 35 year veteran of the Bethlehem Steel. And now I am uh, uh, on the board of the Steel Plant Museum of Western New York. And we're very pleased to be able to uh, work with uh, Audie on this uh, program, uh, uh, throwback videos, it's pretty awesome. I've actually reviewed all of the uh, videos and uh, I do have a couple of uh, observations that are strictly my own opinion for the most part. Uh, the one on the, the very first one where the gentleman from Sparrows Point uh, in the, uh, has a piece of uh, iron ore in his hands that ostensibly came off that ship. We, we had some difficulty with uh, understanding why they would or how they would charge iron ore directly into a blast furnace especially L blast furnace. Uh, that just normally isn't done. It's normally charged with uh, taconite pellets, which are a 65% a, a, a uh, FE uh, content uniform sized pellet. And as a matter of fact, we did see a ship unloading, possibly the one in the background, which appeared to be dripping taconite pellets from the bucket. So. <laughs> I guess uh, in, the, in the interest of not having misinformation uh, put out, potentially, uh, that iron ore, I don't believe, is charged directly into the blast furnace. My own experience, as I mentioned, uh, 
is in the open house of the BOF at uh, Lackawanna, at the Lackawanna Operations, and with some experience, five years at the home office in uh, Martin Tower, uh, which is history right now in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. during, that, uh, ex during that time in, in Bethlehem, I was able to visit all of the plants, including Sparrows Point, but this would go back into the 1970s and 1980s. So that's, that's the era that these, fil these films were produced, uh, apparently, and, uh, and they're very representative of what went on at, at Bethlehem at that, uh, and Sparrows Point at that period of time. Bethlehem Steel's Sparrows Point plant has been producing quality steel for almost a century. Here at Sparrows Point, we produce a variety of high quality steel products. Our main steel products at Sparrows Point are plate and light flat rolled steel, such as tin and zinc coated sheets. This type of steel is used in the automotive, airline, shipbuilding, construction, and manufacturing industries. This video will introduce you to the basic oxygen furnace and the BOF process and the individual team members who are crucial to the success of the steel making process. The BOF produces low cost quality steel by using high purity oxygen to speed the iron decarburization process. The Sparrows Point BOF team is justifiably proud of its production record. On an average day, we produce 35 heats of steel at a temperature of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We do this seven days a week, 365 days per year. It takes about 40 minutes to make a heat of steel. The capacity of the vessel is 295 tons. At 35 heats a day, this amounts to over 10,000 tons of steel a day which is equivalent to the weight of 6,900 automobiles. I'm sure you would agree that this is very impressive. At the conclusion of this video, you will begin your job-specific training. The BOF process begins when production scheduling provides the pulpit with a heat lot plan, which is commonly called the sequence number. The sequence number can be likened to a recipe as it identifies the amount and type of ingredients that must be added to the steel. The sequence number also determines the tasks the BOF team must perform to produce a particular grade of steel. The furnace or pulpit operator is responsible for making sure the sequence number is followed by the BOF team. The four main elements for BOF steel making are hot metal, scrap, oxygen, and fluxes. Let's take a look at how each of these elements is prepared for the furnace charge. The Patapsco and Back Rivers Railroad delivers the hot metal in subs from the blast furnace to the hot metal hole. By the time the subs arrive at the hot metal hole, the blast furnace analysis of the metal has been entered into the BOF process computer. From this point on, it's very important that the BOF team concentrate on doing everything possible to avoid spilling the hot metal. It must be contained in the ladle or furnace at all times for the sake of safety, yield, and process control. The hot metal man performs an initial 80% pour of hot metal into the ladle. He then takes a temperature reading and obtains a white iron sample of the metal. The sample is sent to the BOF Chem Lab and the analysis is entered into the process computer. The blast furnace analysis together with the hot metal temperature allows the pulpit operator to calculate the thermochemical balance. This balance is achieved by determining the final hot metal weight and the amount of scrap, oxygen, and fluxes needed to produce the grade of steel per the sequence number. The analysis of the white iron sample taken at the hot metal hole is used by the pulpit operator to adjust the amount of scrap, oxygen, and fluxes for the heat. After the final calculation is made, the scrap trimmer calls the stockyard crane operator and requests the amount and type of scrap specified by the pulpit operator. 
the stockyard crane operator loads the scrap into a scrap box. The scrap box is delivered by locomotive. It's then placed on the scrap trimmer's posi charger machine by the charging crane. Here the scrap is weighed and the weight is entered into the process computer. At the same time, the hot metal man directs the charging crane operator to move the ladle of hot metal from the hot metal hole. The ladle is moved to the desulfurizer, the skimmer, or the furnace, depending on the sample analysis and the grade of steel to be made. The desulfurizer operator removes the sulfur from the hot metal and skims the resulting slag before the metal is charged into the furnace. The track hopper man makes sure the flux bins are full with the correct fluxes. Fluxes are added to the heat to remove the impurities. The heart of the steel making process is the furnace. This is where all the elements are brought together after individual preparation to produce the steel specified by the sequence number. First, the scrap is charged into the furnace by the scrap trimmer. Scrap is used as a coolant to keep the metal temperature within a specified range during the oxygen blow. Then the charging crane operator charges the hot metal into the furnace. At this point, the charging is complete. The pulpit operator now initiates the oxygen blow. The amount and rate of oxygen and the lance height patterns for the blow are determined by the process computer. After the oxygen is turned on, the computer activates the flux batching system. This system discharges the correct amount of fluxes into the furnace at the proper time. The waste gases generated by the blow are pulled through the hood and gas cleaning network by means of four large draft fans. The scrubber operator is responsible for the proper operation of the fans. The hood operator makes sure there is sufficient water in the hood at all times during the blow. The water in the hood eventually turns to steam, which enters the plant's steam system. Replacement water is then supplied to the hood. When the oxygen blow is complete, the furnace man rotates the furnace, which is called a turndown. He then takes the steel temperature and sample. The temperature is electronically transmitted to the process computer, and the sample is sent to the BOF chem lab to be analyzed. The result of this analysis is sent to the melter via the process computer. After comparing the temperature and sample analysis to the sequence number specifications, the melter makes a decision to reblow to meet turndown specifications or tap the steel in the furnace. The melter then performs an alloy calculation using the process computer. The computer screen displays the type and quantity of alloy additives necessary to obtain the sequence number specifications. He provides the alloy additive information to the stocker. The stocker weighs and loads the necessary alloy additives from bins into buggies. The furnace man tilts the furnace for tap when the melter tells him the steel is okay to tap. As the steel is being tapped, the stocker discharges the alloy additives down the discharge chute into the steel ladle. With approximately 20% of the steel remaining in the vessel, the furnace man drops a slag dart into the vessel's tap hole. The slag dart allows the vessel to be drained of steel while the unwanted slag remains in the vessel. Upon completion of the tap, the furnace man pours the remaining slag into the slag bowl. The molten steel ladle on the ladle car is moved by the furnace man to the stir station. Here the second furnace man stirs the heat by bubbling argon gas into the ladle. This provides a more uniform chemistry and temperature in the steel. He then takes a steel temperature and sample. This sample is sent to the BOF chem lab for analysis. Now the turn foreman, who is responsible for keeping the shop running, inspects the vessel and performs any required lining maintenance. The lining maintenance includes spraying refractory material onto the lining or mixing limestone with vessel slag and baking the mix into the lining. 
the BOF steel making process is complete when the teaming crane picks up, weighs, and transports the ladle of steel to the ladle treatment station, or LTS. Final adjustments to the steel chemistry and temperature are made at LTS. From there, the liquid steel is fed into a continuous casting machine where it solidifies and is cut into 10-inch thick slabs. The coordinator is responsible for tracking each heat from its beginning in the blast furnace to the finished product produced by the caster. He makes sure all the necessary precautions and notifications are made in order to prevent delays. As you have seen, the BOF steel making process requires the concentrated efforts of many people performing various tasks. Therefore, the amount and quality of steel produced is dependent upon the entire team. The team benefits when each member skillfully, efficiently, and safely performs the tasks associated with their job. The additional training you will receive after viewing this video will enhance your job skills. This helps you to safely and efficiently perform your job and be a productive member of the BOF steelmaking team. This training will make your job easier to perform, produce a quality steel product, make the team more productive, keep production costs down. Additionally, this training will contribute to increasing your production and keeping Bethlehem Steel competitive in the steel commodities market. This video has provided an overview of the BOF process. You have seen individual team members perform their interrelated job tasks. Remember, the BOF team needs you, a good team player. After you choose to move from this video screen, you will be presented with a menu offering job-specific training. Please select the training you wish to participate in. Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point Division, the largest steel producer on the East Coast. Steel from Sparrows Point comes in many shapes and sizes, forming some of the most useful products on Earth. To make their products, steel makers begin here with raw materials, iron ore, coal, and limestone. But before these materials are mixed together, the coal is turned into coke. Coke, iron ore, and limestone are charged or dumped into a blast furnace to form iron, the principal metal in steel. As the raw materials enter from the top, Hot air pours in from the bottom, and the coke burns, producing a hot gas. The gas turns the ore into molten iron, and the limestone combines with impurities in the iron. These impurities are called slag, and are removed from the stream as the molten iron leaves the furnace. Sparrows Point's L furnace is the largest blast furnace in the Western Hemisphere producing an average of 9,000 tons of high-quality iron per day. Iron from the blast furnace travels by submarine car 
to the basic oxygen furnace, or BOF. At the BOF, cold steel scrap is charged into the furnace vessel. Next, the molten iron is added. Large volumes of oxygen are blown into the vessel at supersonic speed, and the rapid oxidation turns the iron and scrap into steel. After approximately 40 minutes, the steel is poured from the furnace into a ladle. In both the furnace and the ladle, the steel is metallurgically fine-tuned to meet precise chemical specifications. From the BOF, the steel proceeds to the continuous slab caster. Here, the liquid steel is transferred from a ladle into the top of the casting machine's water-cooled mold. As the steel passes through the mold, it begins to cool and solidify. After the solid strand exits the casting machine 52 feet below the cast floor, it's cut into slabs and transferred to the plant's plate or hot strip mills. At the plate mill, the slabs are reheated and rolled into a heavy gauge flat product which is used in bridges, machinery, rail cars, line pipe, and other heavy equipment. The hot strip mill produces a light gauge flat sheet. Here, slabs from the caster are reheated and then fed through a continuous series of rolling stands. The finished product is coiled and shipped to customers for a wide variety of applications, including auto frames, machinery, and tubing. In the cold mill, sheet thickness is reduced even more improving the steel's surface finish and texture. At the tension leveler, the steel is finely tempered in a separate operation to impart the desired physical properties and finish requested by the customer. For excellent corrosion resistance, some cold rolled sheets are galvanized or zinc coated to be used in products like auto underbodies. Other sheet is treated with galvaloom, an aluminum and zinc coating invented by Bethlehem. These products are used primarily for pre-engineered metal buildings. At the tin mill, steel from the hot strip mill is cold reduced to even lighter gauges, and a tin coating is applied to the steel. Tin mill products have the advantage of good formability and superior corrosion resistance, which means a lot to consumers who buy food and beverages in cans. Steel. For over 100 years, Sparrows Point's mills have been producing steel. We've helped change the face of the nation. Steel products replace horses in the fields and on the road. Rails help move the nation westward. New, higher buildings emerge. Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point Division. For over 100 years, our people have made versatile quality steel. Steel that's strong. Steel that performs. At Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point Division, steel making begins with people. And today, our people are making steel better than ever.
For almost 50 years, the Sparrows Point Cold Mill produced a good product that satisfied its customers. But now there's a new kid on the block, a modern, highly advanced cold mill that will send its competition running. This is Sparrows Point's new cold mill complex, or as the natives call it, Sparrows Point's field of dreams. Well, the cold mill is really the culmination of the finishing of Sparrows Point. If you look at, we essentially became a new mill ever since the beginning of the 1980s. And it's the one piece of Sparrows Point that had never been updated or modernized was the cold mill. We started on the primary side of the mill. We upgraded with the new blast furnace. We upgraded with steel making, the casters. We modernized our hot mill. We modernized our tin mill. We put in new coating lines. We basically rebuilt Sparrows Point with the one exception, and that exception was our cold mill. Going back about a year and a half or, or, mo or more, uh, the, the new cold mill design started coming up, and the whole process began about justifying the new cold mill. There was a junction that we came to as we were going down that road that we needed to get approval for the new mill. And it wasn't just approval for a new mill, quite frankly, it was approval for the continued existence of the Sparrows Point plant. As far as the, the quality of the product goes, we'll be as good as anybody in the United States, possibly as good as anybody in the world. We've got, uh, to, to, to use a term that's maybe overdone, but world-class equipment. We've got some of the best equipment that money can buy. Uh, on the other side, customer service, which is, which is very important. That's one of the, the, the core principles of this plant. Um, having a continuous operation, a pickler linked to a tandem mill, we can have a coil from a hot coil storage into our coal roll storage in a matter of minutes. So customer service wise, if, if we have it in our hot roll inventory, we can have a coil out the door in, in times that just aren't conceivable to what we're used to here at Sparrows Point. The future of the new cold mill looks promising. The customer is going to get one time delivery more often, if not all the time, and they're going to get the quality and the material that they're purchasing. Quality, on-time delivery, and service. That's exactly what the new mill will deliver. With state-of-the-art equipment and highly trained people, this cold mill will deliver a superior product on time to our customers. We will certainly be on the leading edge now of producing a flat sheet with improved surface characteristics and also very close tolerance gauge control. This will allow us to get into markets that up until now we've not been able to get into. Things that are very critical markets such as the appliance industry, such as office furniture. Uh, we'll even be able to get into some automotive applications, which Sparrows Point has never in cold rolled products been in automotive applications. Now there won't be the broad base of automotive applications, but very selective and we'll be able to supply that now. When it comes to giving our customers a superior product, Building a new mill with world-class equipment is only part of the process. Just as important is a skilled staff within the mill. The training program that we've established for the new mill is quite extensive. In fact, it's probably the most training we've done for any single facility on a startup basis that we've done in the company so far. We've had people going as far away as to Austria. We've had a number of hourly and salaried people going to Austria. We've had classes here that have covered everything from pipe fitting to, to business conditions and marketing aspects of the new mill. When you talk about training, you have to understand that we're coming from literally from 1950s technology into 1990s, uh, 2000 technology. The amount of automation, computerization, uh, it's, a, it's a quantum leap for most of our people. There is, of course, a strong emphasis on training, but the issue of safety has not been overlooked. In fact, safety is a value. Someday we're going to be able to sit back and kind of reflect on this project. And there's probably a handful of things that we'll remember for a long time. One of those things will be the safety performance. Our Bethlehem employees, along with the contractors, combined for over 3 million man hours without a lost workday case. Um, that happened because they wanted it to happen. It happened because they tried to make it happen. It wasn't just luck. And that kind of performance will, will stay with us for a long time and will carry that momentum with us as we go into operation 
from a production standpoint, um, the quality off of these machines has exceeded spec our expectations, it has exceeded the specifications. Um, as of the sixth week of operation, the Pickler Tandem Mill has exceeded its flatness criteria, it's exceeded its gauge performance criteria. From the very first heat, the anneal shop has produced a coil that is cleaner than anything we've seen before with consistent metallurgical properties that, that are unheard of around here. Uh, the skin mill has producing a strip that is virtually dead flat with elongation control that is just unbelievable. Since October of last year, the packaging lines have been stretch wrapping coils with, with what is probably the best package you'll find anywhere. The drive-through shipping facility is working wonderfully. Uh, truckers are able to talk directly with crane operators. They're in and out of here faster than probably any other steel mill in the country. Um, these things will be absolutely obvious to the customer from their very first load of steel. They'll get a, a coil that's flat. They'll get a coil that's clean. They'll get a coil that's consistent in metallurgical properties uh, head to tail. They'll get a coil that's packaged in an airtight package. They'll get a coil delivered on time by a happy trucker. W what else could you ask for? These, these are the standards of the 21st century. This is what everybody else is going to be shooting for, and this is what we have at Sparrow's Point. In the future, we're going to be able to compete with anybody. And with a new mill, we'll, for the first time, you know, really be at the top of our game with top of the level equipment, making top end product. And that's something everybody's looking forward to. This uh, cold mill is unique on the East Coast, and we will certainly be the leading producer of cold roll products on the East Coast. Even at this early stage, Sparrows Point's field of dreams has a reputation. For the customer, it's a mill that will deliver an exceptional product and outstanding customer service. For the competition, it's a mill to watch carefully because there's no stopping Sparrow's Point's Field of Dreams. Yeah, the one I found very enlightening was the one on the new coal mill. Uh, although that didn't have a very extended life at Sparrow's Point, it was certainly the most modern, as the uh, narrator said, the most modern in the country and perhaps in the world. Mm -hmm. So I hope all of our uh, viewers enjoy the uh, videos and uh, I have to give credit to the Baltimore Museum of Industry for their efforts in putting this together. Great, thank you so much. Thank for you, Annie. Yeah, and we appreciate hearing your commentary. Thank you.